I am what's known as a non-traditional president. That's right. I took a very different path to get to where I am today at Metropolitan State University of Denver and this TED stage. I began my career in the US Air Force. This is me as a C-130 pilot. I must have been 25 years old, flying somewhere over the Pacific. This is the beginning of about a 25 or 30 year journey of me climbing a very different ladder than most university presidents. Instead of being a professor and then climbing the ladder into university administration, I climbed into a very different administration, the Obama administration. <laughs> this is me a few years back as the Undersecretary of the Navy. For those of you who don't know much about the military, that's kind of a pretty high position, one of the top positions in the Pentagon, actually. Um, the number two position, uh, civilian, appointed by the President for the United States Navy. So you might ask, you know, why would somebody like that want to come here and have a job like this? Well, the short answer is I got fired. <laughs> like all of us in the administration, we had to move on. But that's just why I left. But why did I come here? And the truth is, 2016 was a bit of a wake-up call. For me, personally, I had been climbing this ladder, I had been focused externally on America's role in the world, and what I realized during that year, during that election year, was that something else was happening in this country that I hadn't really noticed, or I hadn't paid as much attention to. But other people had been. There was a group of economists led by this guy, Raj Shetty, out of Stanford, that put some research together to demonstrate that there actually was something happening in this country, and it was the fading of the American dream. Now this chart shows that it actually wasn't just a fiction or something people felt. It was something that was real. If you were born in the 1940s, the baby boomer generation, you had a 90% chance of doing better than your parents. That was sort of the definition of the American dream. If you were born in the 80s, and those are the millennials today, you had a 50% chance. And you could say, well, so, you know, the economy changed and, you know, post-World War II era or whatever else. But there's something else got my attention, too, that was in their report, and that's the, what I would call the big American dream. The chance that if you were at the bottom part of the socioeconomic scale, if you were poor, what are your chances of getting up into the higher reaches of um, our economy? And in America today, your chances are only 7.5%, which sounds pretty bad. But here's the kicker. In Canada, 13.5%. So I'm not cool with that, right? <laughs> I mean, Canada is kicking our ass in the American dream. Like, how did that happen, right? So, I mean, a lot of dialogue and de debate over this issue ensued that I was reading about. And a lot of people pointed to the elite universities in this country, and they said, you know, there are more people at those universities in the top 1% than there are in the entire bottom 60, and that's not cool. We need to get more people into those schools so that they can achieve the American dream. That's probably a pretty good argument, but I kind of took a different tack. I came here instead. MSU Denver is what's called a regional comprehensive university and it's open access. And what does that mean? It means that if you grew up poor, if you grew up uh, one of those high schools that wasn't exactly college prep, if your parents didn't have the kind of money uh, to, get to send you to those Gucci SAT courses so that you could up your scale and get into those so-called elite schools, you could still come to a place like MSU Denver by passion, by purpose, and actually as it happens by law. We will take you. And what that means is that people like Theodore DeWeese, who grew up low income, first in his family to ever go to college, didn't quite know what he wanted to do, wasn't very well prepped, came to, came to this school. He had to take remedial math. He had to work hard in an outside job at an auto shop. And it took him just over six years to graduate. But he did, magna cum laude, 
So it wasn't about that he wasn't capable, it was that he wasn't as prepared as he might have been because of his background. And today, he's the vice dean at Johns Hopkins University and one of the top cancer doctors in the world. So that's the kind of thing that happens at schools like this. And these kinds of schools, it's not just here. There, there are a number of them around the country, and they're right under your noses. That's the kind of thing that happens, that can happen. But there are some challenges that I've learned, as I've been told, being a university president is the hardest job in the world. And one of the things that makes it hard is what people say about higher ed. OK, so people say, yeah, it's getting expensive, it's out of touch, and here's the one I really don't like. And you know, college, it's not really for everyone. You know, maybe not everybody. What? You know, is that what you tell your kids? I know it's not what the rich people tell their kids. You know why I know that? Because some of them are going to jail for spending $500,000 to get their kids in the side door of those other schools. Now, why are they doing that, right? Because we know the truth. As my dad likes to say, you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your facts. And it just is the fact that in today's highly globalized, information-oriented, complex economy and society, you actually need a higher degree in order to make it. Not only that, you are exponentially more likely to make more money. You're going to make, by some research, over a million dollars more in your lifetime. You have better health outcomes. You're going to be much better off in your retirement. So all those things lead to the obvious conclusion that you should go to school. OK, but it's also a good idea for you to go to school for society. Because some people say, well, I shouldn't have to pay for other people to go. Well, it turns out that the Lumina Foundation has, has demonstrated that not only uh, is it good for you and your own economy, your own economic purpose, but it's also good for America. <laughs> uh, you are much more likely to pay into the system than to take from the system, and here's a good one, you're 4.9 times less likely to go to jail. <laughs> That's a big deal. It's not trivial, actually. Um, turns out that you know, we spend a lot more money on jail than we do on college. So our investment strategy is a little bit twisted. <laughs> now let me walk you through a little bit of the math, OK? In, 19, in the 1980s, it cost $800 a year to go to a university, a public university. At $3.10 an hour, which was the minimum wage, that meant you needed to work 6.5 weeks in the year in order to pay your tuition, or 8.7 part-time. Now, that's a summer job, folks, and that's how a lot of us did it. That's how a lot of the Fortune 500 CEOs did it, actually. But their kids, 2018, $10,230 a year, $7.25 an hour, means you got to work. 35 weeks to pay just your tuition and nothing else. So what does that mean? It means there literally are not enough hours in the day, weeks in the year, to work your way through school like people used to do, right? Those are the numbers. So how, how did we get here? <laughs> well, it turns out that uh, all of us who sort of thought we put ourselves through school in the 1980s, we had an angel investor. It was called the American people, paying 60 to 80 percent, depending on your state, of the tuition, and the students paid the rest. But today, in Colorado, it's flipped. That's the primary reason college is so expensive today, is the disinvestment, the systematic disinvestment that we have made uh, in, our, in our society. I'm not okay with that either frankly. And we also, not only have we disinvested, I mean, it's, we basically pulled the ladder up behind us. We achieved the American dream, turned around, pulled the ladder up on our own kids, right? And then we do something else that's even worse, or not, not even worse, but also that complicates it, is that we tell them that they still have to do it the same way we did it. We still tell them that there's this four-year path and you need to work really hard, and it's not just people and parents, it's policy that basically says in, in scholarship money that says you have to be in school full time. When we know, like I just showed you, that the math doesn't work. So when we are telling our kids, our students, and they're not just kids anymore, we're giving them a false choice. You can either quit your job 
so you can go full time, or you, you know, or or you, you you're not going to make it in time. Well, what is in time, right? Four years or six years? You can have a six-year path, and you can actually do pretty well. You can work along the way, right? And um, then when you graduate, follow me on this. Take a little bit longer than four years. Work along the way. Now you graduate with less debt and a job, job skills. Or you go four years, maybe you cram it into that, mo that model, forces you to take out more debt. That all works if the parents are paying, right? And I know some parents in the audience are saying, wait a second, I want that kid out in four years. Well, if you're paying, good for you, and you're probably right, get your kid out as soon as, you po as possible. But that is not the reality for the vast majority of Americans today, okay? So what can we do? A couple things. Number one, let's fix this. Okay? Legislators, taxpayers, voters. <laughs> let's reinvest in our future. Okay? Number two, push back on this narrative that college doesn't matter. College does matter. We need it for our country to be competitive. We need it for our civil society to be robust and healthy, and everybody needs an opportunity because that's the American way. Number three, calm down. <laughs> Just breathe through your nose a little bit. Stop trying to cram these students into this four-year model that doesn't work for them. Stop telling them that they're not doing it right. They're working their butts off. We're the ones that aren't doing it right. We're the ones that aren't telling them the right way to do it. We're the ones that need to adapt. So if you're an employer out there, partner with schools like ours. Get left of the graduation timeline and help students along their way. Give them tuition assistance. Give them flexible work hours. And if you're a university, craft different kinds of pathways. We can do this. If you're a donor, rethink that full-time requirement for your student. Because most of them are working 30 to 40 hours a week. And I just told you about how the math doesn't work. So what I'm saying is, join me on this mission. It's going to take all of us to toss that ladder back down for the next generation. It's going to take all of us to ensure that the American dream isn't just a dream, but that it's a possibility. And that is what is worth fighting for. Thank you.